Bill from Australia. Uh, Richard Miller, never not here. You caught me right in the beginning of my cruise, you know, like I'm really moving through a new country, a new territory, and I really truly believe a new consciousness might even go deeper than that because some people say Australia is so primordial, something about the land, and I haven't really discovered that yet. But I mean, I feel it. <laughs> I feel something really different and strange, you know. And so then I can relate to it. And uh, so anyhow, I think there's going to be a lot of talks here because I'm just, you know, people are so open to me. It's unbelievable. And uh, so then I, I'm going to go short on the introductions because <laughs> let's get right to it. Please help me welcome Rame Richards. Thank you, Rame, for coming. It's a cue applause. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I mean, right. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if I had all the assistants and we were in a studio and, you know, they hold up a sign, you know, <laughs> hooray. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it is a hooray to talk about um, a topic that um, makes some sense about your life and not just be diverted and be uh, entertained, right? And, and this is surely entertaining. That's fine with me. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we're actually looking at each other in the eye and we're trying to say uh you know what's real about us and what's real about love and what's re real about this planet and and uh sometimes it looks like it needs some 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 of our tender care mm. and uh i know you you're kind of in touch with the like the frequencies or the vibrations right and so then you can you can feel the connections yeah i guess my um my gift right now is to facilitate that for other people, to enable other people to open to that in in a short period of time. Um, so I work with a process unique to me as far as I know, where people can enter an expanded state of consciousness without any training and very quickly and easily. And it's usually life transforming for them and that's been you know, a journey for me over the last 15 or 16 years to uh, to share that in a, in a way that's, um, that people can understand it. Yeah. You say without much time, right? And so in, the, in many ways, that's like uh, the syndrome that we live in, right? We In yeah. the Western world, that's it's right. like without now, much time, yeah. you know, we don't have much time or other, or, you know, it just seems like um, I was in business for myself, for instance, and and then I also lived in Italy. And in Italy, there's kind of a, people that work for family corporations, they know they're not gonna go very high in it because they're not in the family, yeah. right? And so then they have time. You know, they, they take time when they're out of business and when they're out of their uh, work, they're exploring their lives and exploring their friends and exploring, you know, they have friends for 30 years or longer, you know? Mm. And, uh, but me, when I was in my own business, boy, there was all, there was a list as long as your arm of things I could do, should do, would mm -hmm. do. And like, I would always say, if I could do one more thing today, that'd probably be cool. And then that was no times, absolutely no time, mm. no time for enlightenment. So go to rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because I mean, in some disciplines, um, you know, people might study for a lifetime to achieve the opening that's uh, n not just me, the people I teach, the practitioners I teach can facilitate in about an hour and a half. Um, and, and it's almost too, it's good enough to be true. I was going to say it's too good to be true. It's good enough to be true. And it's kind of interesting because I think it's needed now. You know, I think that uh, consciousness is crying out for it. So that's why it's here, and that's why it's found its place, and that's why I'm I'm doing it. So, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, interesting, interesting things over the last uh, fifteen or sixteen years. But I, right now, I'm seeing an acceleration in consciousness, which is which has been predicted, of course. But uh, we're actually in it, and that's kind of fun because I thought uh, maybe it wasn't going to come or it wasn't going to be so obvious, but I reckon it is. I reckon it's very obvious if you uh, look at what's happening on the planet now. Yeah. Right. So it's a pleasure to be part of that. It's a pleasure to be facilitating that for people. And most of all, um, <clears throat> teaching practitioners. So it's like teaching a man to fish. You know, I'm not just fishing for people. I'm able to create You're a large teaching number. fishermen. I'm teaching fishermen, which is good. Yeah. It brings me a lot of joy. Yeah. yeah. 
of course, the basics of it, you know, consciousness is just kind of like awareness in life, right? Because we're all conscious and we're... But then expanded consciousness means like another point of view or a wider, a broader spectrum or something like you could see more... You could see uh, what uh, how others are involved with your life or somehow... Oh, more than that. Yeah. It's, a, it's that accessing the superconscious, that accessing the never-ending now in full consciousness. So it's a, accessing a place of uh, absolute bliss, uh, but also a place where everything falls into perspective because you're no longer attached to the physical plane and you also see how what an illusion the physical plane is, uh, you know, well, we have a lot of fun here and I love being here as a human being, but uh, it's actually a very, very small part of our consciousness. And uh, when people get that in a, in a personal, you know, not in a theoretical way, when they actually experience that, then that can be life changing for them. And then it also gets easier from that point to access the, st the state of um, super consciousness where you're in touch with everything and your consciousness is infinite uh, and you can explore that, then uh, challenges on this plane move into perspective and uh, life can be a lot more fun. Yeah, okay, let's say now, you know, because I'm trying to, <coughs> <Pardon me. coughs> trying to stay with the basics, you know, and say like, okay, uh, uh, this physical plane or this plane is limited and actually a very small part of what our what our consciousness is, right? That's right. But and couldn't that be kind of like the game is to make this this actual manifest world reflect more of consciousness? Yeah, you yeah. Know? So I mean, that's part of uh, awakening to understand how much we affect our reality around us in so many ways, subtle and obvious. And of course, when you reach an expanded state, you get that. You you get how much you influence everything in your life. I mean, then practicing that can be a challenge, but it's a fun challenge. Right. So we influence things by how we think. How and we then feel. We, how we feel, mm -hmm. right? But that's in a way how we think, because if we think that everyone's against us, we feel kind of down, right? Yeah, I would... They're so would closely put, related. I would put more emphasis on feeling than thinking, because I think that's part of... The, <laughs> I feel that's part of the challenge with the 21st century is that we think far too much. Uh, we spend a lot of our lives in thought rather than either being or feeling, just being present, uh, which is, you know, it's not so hard and, and it's not something that requires, it requires a little bit of discipline, I guess, but you can be present gardening, you can be present cycling, do you know what I mean? You don't have to lock yourself away in a room to be here and now and be aware of everything around you. So it's not so, it's not such a hard call, and, and I think um, many many disciplines would have you think that it's quite a hard thing to be that, that one would strive for, when in fact it's actually at our fingertips. It's very easy in some ways once you understand it. So I mean, it's accessible to everyone, is what I'm saying. It doesn't need years of study. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's 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 very encouraging, you know, because uh, like you said, we need it. We need you know? it. And yeah. then, okay, like I kind of look at it too, you know, I hear two schools, you know, like maybe it's the same, but one is kind of like those feelings. Okay, well, the good thing about the feelings is since they're in your body, they're here now, mm -hmm. right? And, well, you could have a memory of a feeling, I suppose, but and that might even be reflecting in your body, kind of a memory of a feeling. Yeah, sure. So then we don't really know if that's totally accurate, but somehow... I, I would say, actually, I'll interrupt and say yeah. I feel that's very accurate, yeah. that feelings manifest illness. Yeah. Uh, trapped feelings, uh, trauma that's held from another time and space can manifest right. a serious illness. That's what I've seen. Well, let's talk about trapped. Time. You know, trapped. Does that mean trapped because it's habitual? Uh, no, because it's because it's never been released. I mean, in 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 my work, uh, we do a lot of trauma release from other times and places and other realities, um, and the feelings. <clears throat> Well, you could apply it to this time and space too. It's it's a general rule, but the the feelings that you have in a moment of trauma can stay stuck in your body uh, because our culture doesn't know how to release them. It doesn't know how to let them go or, or can't find them. So it's not unusual for people to see me who have a repeated uh, physical challenge that's refusing treatment by other modalities. And the reason it's refusing treatment is that, that the practitioners or conventional medicine 
is not looking at the root cause of the challenge, which may be trauma in another time and space. So once we get to the trauma and release the trauma, then the physical challenge immediately disappears in that moment. There's a dramatic physical change. So, Clayke, these things are authored in another time and space, right? But I mean, mm -hmm. or somehow, the, and then the memory of it is here, right? And that memory, I don't know, it's just not a thought, you know, it's a, it's a, it's feeling, a feeling. And it's yeah. more than a feeling, even it's like <clears throat> a meaning. You know, it's, it's a, a meaning, like... Well, it's a feeling that imprints on the physical uh, uh -huh. and in, in some instances continues to attract the same trauma. Yeah. until the original trauma yeah, is yeah. released. But in, I like where you say imprints on the physical, because, you know, so many people are talking about cellular memories and stuff, but I think that's just that feeling imprinting. And the moment that feeling lifts, then the cellular sc cells go, ha, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how about that? Everything you know? changes, yeah. Yeah, because it can instantly change. Uh, some healings can happen overnight. Yeah, oh, in a moment, really, in a moment. Uh, uh -huh. So it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful to share that and to help people understand that. So anyhow, I don't know exactly what you, the word you use, but kind of like undigested trauma or undigested... Unresolved. Uh, unresolved, yeah. right. Okay, so that's one. One way is to kind of just uh, stay with that feeling and whatever, wherever it's from or whatever, you know, just, you know, you can just feel it and let it go up and down and, mm, oh, oh, and this feels weird, you know, or awful, you know, or maybe you can go from awful to weird, right? It's just well, out of the normal. In, in my technique, we, we go to the moment it started, and um, which, you know, more often than not, is not in this present time and, and space, and resolve <clears throat> the feelings in that time, or resolve how, how the client felt at that time, and resolving those feelings changes the present. So it's, for me, it's all a matter of going to the root cause, to the moment of the usually trauma and uh, dealing with how someone felt then. And that's often a traumatic past life death or often a traumatic experience in another reality. So it's a, the, the other reality in the past lives are actually really, really easy to access. Is it important to name them? In other words, like you say, okay, you were uh, in the court of Cleopatra and they decided to execute you or something, but I mean, I'm just playing, yeah, playing cool. a game yeah, now, sure. but I mean, Otherwise, you could just unusual. feel it. You could just feel it, right? I mean, <laughs> no, no. It's important for the client uh, yeah, yeah, to yeah. go there and actually experience it yeah. and understand the dynamics. They like the to have that picture of it. Uh, it's more than that. They experience it physically. and the feeling. But yeah. I mean, the picture. In order to feel a feeling, they want they want to somehow that picture evokes that feeling. It's like going to a movie. You get a feeling from the picture on the movie. Right? Okay, so it's not it's not it's not always quite like that. Some people are able are able. Uh, most people actually are able to have a graphic recall um, visually, but a lot of people access the information through uh, an emotional recall. But through that, they're able to describe things graphically as if they were there. Mm -hmm. And of course, the key is um, how you felt at the moment of the trauma, or how you felt actually usually at the moment of your death. And it's often, for, for people who are new to this field, uh, uh, fear is often not part of it. Uh, or you know, it's, there are other emotions involved. Oh, yeah. So, so a novice might say, "Oh, well, everybody's frightened at the moment of death," and actually, they're not. There's a whole stack of other emotions going on. Yeah. I was just checking it out. I think it was yesterday. You know, I was getting in the swimming pool, which is slightly cold, you know, but not really when you get in there. And I was just saying, "Can I get in there without going?" <gasps> Like that, you know, and I really can't, you know. <laughs> I mean, so at a moment of death, I think it's a little worse than a swimming pool, right? <laughs> <laughs> it varies, but uh, <laughs> let, let's say a lot of the trauma that's held is not about fear of death. Uh -huh. It's often about betrayal or other things that have gone down in the moments before death, you know. Okay, that's one, you know, like we're just going through the feelings and somehow we're evoking some kind of old memories, you know, and where they come from. And they're pictures, let's say. I don't even know because we can't really time to this life and all that. And then sometimes they seem accurate. So we seem, we say, well, it must have been, there must be some truth to that because how you were never in, in Egypt. So how did you know where the Nile goes into the blah, blah, or whatever? Oh, but also know? there's a physical recall. The clients yeah. will feel, will, will feel what happened in their death as well. So it's beyond... It's emotional and physical and intellectual to a point, in so much as the client's figuring out what's happening and mm -hmm. why. But it's common for people to experience physically what happened to them 
in the moment of death or let's say to be more accurate in the moment of trauma mm -hmm. so then i mean uh, what i wanted to do was jump over and say well there's another way too because that i practiced a lot and just came to me kind of naturally and maybe because i'm an intellectual guy but i kind of restored things and then tried them on for size you know put on another story like a suit of clothes right mm -hmm. okay like my father was kind of heavy on me but i realized that he never gave up on me mm -hmm. you know and for his way he was always going to try to to give me some gift, you know, something. Mm. And it was seemed to be heavy, but I mean, he never just said, okay, you're a lost cause. I'll just leave you be. Mm. And I, and I just, I got it totally that that was total love, you know, and mm. then that restoring it just made that, that so different. Another thing was like, okay, my wife left me for another guy. And then I just thought, you know, I don't know. I got a hint too, but someone gave me a hint or said, Hey, this could be an option. She's free. And so are you. Mm. My God, I felt so good, and I loved her so much, mm. you know. And so then restoring can just change all those feelings, too, and complete them. And sometimes feeling them, I don't know, sometimes it seems like feeling them can re-trigger them in a way and maybe semi-resolve uh, uh, them. But maybe the story is the structure, that subconscious structure is still there and it doesn't deconstruct. I've seen it where, you know, people go through a lot time and again. You know, how, how about all these spiritual experiences that people have? And, and then, in a way, I mean, I know so many people that have been working on things for, I'm getting older, you know, 40 years or more. And they're, they're kind of the same guy, really. Mm. You know, I mean, for the masses, I mean, I'm sure you're working with uh, teachers and so on and you're seeing a lot of, changes that are permanent yeah you know? yeah and uh well i mean you can you know it's the old proverb you can take a horse to water <laughs> yeah i mean like you can enable or facilitate or create an opening <clears throat> but what people do with that is entirely up to them fortunately i like to feel in my work that uh, <clears throat> with most people it's it's a profound and continuing effect uh the ones i bump into occasionally tell me that but yeah, it's yeah, it's what people do with it. So people could, can have a, a whole life plan revealed to them, or a, a, let's say a pre-birth agreement about what they might do in this life, and still refuse to do it because it seems too big or too hard. And m mostly, I think people do, but uh, there are a few people I think who just go, "Okay, well, that was interesting." Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's like jumping in the deep end, you know. Wouldn't it be better just to kind of like start sit, finding your life little areas where you could say yes, little yeses, and just start adding them up and say, gee, that was not so bad. Hey, that was a lot of fun. Hey, look at all the things I'm doing. And, hey, I found one that's really interesting because so many times we don't even find our interest because mm -hmm. we're just like narrowly, narrowly pursuing certain th preconceptions, right? And so then, you know. I'm more of a deep end kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, come on, kick them in the deep end, you know. They'll swim or they won't. <laughs> yeah, mostly they will. And they can always get out and stop, you know. Yeah. But well, they so, do. Yeah. Doesn't everyone, st so many people stop, because every time you stop, wonder. You're on a plateau of knowing, right? Even teachers. Say that in some of the words for me. Let me grasp what you're saying. Okay, like... Uh, uh, you know, so many people are saying that you re we really do what do we really know, you know? And then, then other then with the se second breath, they start to say science is proving that all electrons are touching or mm. something like that, so we're all one, you know. But what do we know about that, you know? Or that they say Uranus is here and there, and so then there's another two years of big changes. Okay. But I mean, uh, we don't know anything really. And then the, the, mirror, uh, you know, the universe is such a miracle, see? And if we live in that unknowingness, that's kind of like without that wall of uh, cognition that our attention falls to saying, I know this, I know that. Yeah. What's left is just kind of like an open heartedness, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really about being in the now, isn't it? It's about just being in this moment, just enjoying this moment without thinking about the next one or about thinking about how we might have got here or what theories apply to how you got here just being here yeah that's why i don't like to go to so many so much to past life well i never have really tried it but i've kind of not been too attracted to it and so you know to know too much you know because i'd rather hey we don't know anything about this life why should i know anything about another life right i don't know anything about my dad you know or uh, you know my mom or so it's all it's not so much a matter of um uh, ex, ex, unnecessary knowledge about um, 
other times and places. It's just about understanding where the trauma's held and why it's repeating, why you haven't released it. That's all. So, I mean, you could have, a, not that I will do it for clients, but you could have a real fairground experience where you go visiting here, there and everywhere. Um, really, I'm just interested in finding out where the blockage is that's affecting this life, which, of course, because we're... We are infinite beings existing on many planes of reality simultaneously, then it's not all going to be here. Some of the repetition will be here and some uh, new experience will be here. But of course, because we've been ex in existence, in consciousness for such a long time on, as I said, many levels of existence, then it's appropriate that we go and find out. Oh, that's where it started. I understand now. I'm ready. I'm prepared to release it. And releasing it's actually really easy. It's all a matter of understanding it. So, yeah, it's very useful to go to the source of the trauma that's affecting you now in order to access more bliss. Because, of course, when you're trauma-free, you can access absolute bliss, which, again, is really easy. I want to ask about bliss, you know, because I know that it's sometimes nice to know to be reinforced that what's happening is normal or something like that and just be able to relax for it, in it, right? Not necessarily bliss, but any kind of, even uh, the dark night of the soul or whatever. But when we, if we were tempted to expect something and, and the first thing we could say is like, bliss, you know, bliss can happen and it happened to me sometimes. And the, the major thing I can say about it, it's not here right now. Right. And so then already I'm in a judgment, right? Like that life could be better. Right. And then I'm, I'm, I'm not in the present, but I'm in my mind thinking like, okay, I'll know bliss when I see it again. Right. And, uh, I don't, it seems like a danger, right? I mean, c couldn't life be bliss and no bliss just as my, I mean, why well, should it be bliss? Well, I think the, the key is to understand that we're always in bliss all the time. We See, now there up, you go. <laughs> we're just not always aware of it. So, so if you get that, then there isn't an in or an out of. You're always there, but it's a matter of degree or it's a matter of Cele presence. Celebrating it or something. Huh? Or just being there. I mean, for most people to be in bliss all the time, you wouldn't function very well on this plane. Um, you know, you'd be in bliss. <laughs> Nothing would be that relevant really here. So it's good to visit it to touch it and remind yourself of, this is what I am, this is all I am. I am perfection, I am an infinite being of light and unconditional love, and in that space everything is perfect. And I'll come back to this reality and chug along here, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like there is, it's all, it's all perfect, it's all fine. It's, so I, I see accessing bliss maybe differently to the way you see it, because it's it, having that tangible experience of unity consciousness is life transforming and to know that you can quite easily visit it again should you need to is kind of reassuring for a lot of people that it's not not a concept it's not an illusion it just is and as i keep saying it's actually very easy to get there but our culture doesn't really acknowledge that uh, and it doesn't encourage it and, uh, as I've said, there are many um, schools that would have you think that it's hard to access, that it takes years of study or discipline. It doesn't. So, uh, bliss is an inner phenomenon. Uh, it's, it's an everything phenomena. It's, mm -hmm. it's not... It doesn't, okay, I'll say it's independent. It doesn't depend on anything, right? No, it doesn't because it's always there. Okay, so then we're thinking we want to do bliss, right? Or we want to taste it. We want to yeah, taste bliss. Yeah. So then we're going to go somewhere and we're going to try to somehow to push, it, push it or create it or something. You know, not create it, but create the conditions, okay, or something. So then somehow we, uh, we think, well, bliss is quiet and joyous and stuff. So maybe if we make the outside quiet and joyous. That might help. That might help, you mm. know. And so then, in order to make the outside quiet, we kind of push away the noise, right? Mm. And we find this isolated, beautiful place. And with these beautiful people, and uh, if anyone's kind of like turbulent in the mind or kind of like 
anxious or something like that, we say, okay, you can come to the next class after you get calmed down a little bit, you know. And so anyhow, we're creating a separation, aren't we? And we're believing that bliss is only on this little island, right? I mean, we're not even believing it. We're not saying it. But somehow, that's how it came. So then that seems the way to rec- the natural way to recreate it. Well, I think bliss can be accessed anytime, anywhere. Yeah. Because it's always here. If you teach it like that, maybe so, you yeah. know. Uh, and yes, it makes sense to put yourself in as harmoni- harmonious a place as you can. I mean, of course, but uh, it's just there always. So that's all there is to it. So it always is. It always will be. You always were. You always are. You always will be in that state. Uh, most humans are under the illusion that they're not there when, in fact, they are. So it's i guess for me it's a matter of understanding that on the deepest possible level so that that then affects the way you deal with everything every every little challenge and every joy so yeah it's not it's not separate from us it is us we are that and it's it having experienced that it's how do we how do we embody it how do we be with it how do we acknowledge it it's not i don't see it as separate from us but it's it's a matter of knowing that to your core and then things can change dramatically for people if they want them to as i said our culture here certainly the western culture is is very focused on uh, unfortunately on greed on possessions materialism um and that kind of pushes away the opportunity, you know, that people see bliss in having the newer car, the bigger TV, the bigger house. Not just, do, do you see what I'm getting at? So well, they see success or something like that in that. And then they see uh, there's no time for bliss, right? That's because that doesn't have any bottom line to it, right? But I actually think people believe that there's, they'll be more joyful if they have a bigger TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've never, sold. okay, look, let's say they've gone to satsang even, you know, but much less they've gone to church for sure. And they've gone and they've done this and they might have devoted uh, uh, 10 years of their life to volunteer work. And yeah. They might have done all kinds of stuff, but they never got uh, the promise, you know, the promise of the churches and even the promise of satsangs and uh, spiritual teachers. I mean, yeah, yeah, they get an experience. It always comes and goes. I'm, I so guess then, what I'm saying, the promise is present all the time. It's actually really well, easy. You know, to I hear you to. saying that. Yeah. I totally hear you, but I'm yeah. just kind of like making excuses for people why people might not, you know, they didn't really get the goods. They feel like right, they, yeah. the promise is here, but then the mouth somehow, you know, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I guess I, I, you know, okay. Like let me let me say it like this. Let's see how this goes. Every perception creates a reflection in your body which is also a feeling, mood, and, uh, and uh, emotion. Yeah. And, uh, and so then, and uh, sometimes we're fortunate where our life is not as harsh as other people. And when we look at those other people, and we get some real shocking reverberations that we're not used to, right? Because uh, we had a nice family life, and we lived mm-hmm. in a nice part of the community, and actually our country wasn't at war, and all mm-hmm. that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, you know? I mean, and when we look over there, whew! We don't know how to handle that. We don't know what to do with that energy. Like the ant, in other words, like the sense of pain and injustice brings up such an energy in us. We don't, we don't have a clue what to do with that, and we don't know if it's destructive to us or like it get, makes us anxious or, you know, we don't know how to take it. You know, and so then there's a huge tendency. Okay, we said it, you know you can find your bliss by making things outside quiet, right? There's a huge tendency, I believe, to ignore the world and take rob our attention from all those our brothers and sisters. And uh, even the planet Earth, who needs us, they need our attention. Well, I guess it's a matter of how much you want to engage in in a drama that's not yours. That's what it comes but down to. But that's what I'm just saying. It yeah. is yours. Because if there's it, oneness, it, it's it, yours. Is it here now? Yeah, but you could say that because we're, we're a negated community. We live in a special place. We've gone we we to our whole life to live here, you know. That's right. We live in a sacred place. Yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, in a way, everyone lives in a sacred place, but they might be killing each other there, too. And uh, we've kind of designed it with police forces and an army. We've got army and navy. We've got a fleet out there, and mm-hmm. we've got all that stuff. So that we, c- I don't really trust to say, is it here now? Because we've gone to great extent to 
make sure, damn well sure, it's not here. So go on, go on, to help me some more. I'm still okay. Not well, I mean, uh, you know, okay, you say oneness, but I don't even have to say oneness. I mean, you, I can just say that uh, you go to, uh, you go, you travel around. There's a, okay. What if you're a journalist and you decide to cover the world? You're on the beat or the world beat, and mm -hmm. you go to the starving places, you go to the disease places, you go to the AIDS epidemics, you go to the uh, refugee camps, you go to all the stuff that nobody else, uh, the rest of us, we're, we're not interested in your news, you know, because we say, why should I put it in my face? As if the world was wide enough for us to be over here. You know, in other words, we're claiming unity, we're claiming oneness, we're claiming vastness, but yet we're ignoring our brother and, and actually creating a separate wall. Even the word karma, karma means that my karma is good, you know, and I'm sorry for those guys, but my karma is good, so I'm going to celebrate no pain. There's no pain in my life. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't agree. Yeah. Um, because I'm talking about uh, uh, the oneness that we all are always on the highest level. We're not, the physical plane is not a particularly high level. So there's no of, oneness on the physical it's plane? It's full of challenges. I think it would, our aim is to experience oneness on the physical plane. But what I'm saying is that we are all one on a higher level of consciousness. We agree, if you like, to being separate down here. I'm separate from you. Uh, the wall feels separate from me. And the trees feel separate from me. And the wall feels separate from me. But actually, we're all one on the highest level. Is what I'm saying making sense to you? Well, I mean, I don't know if I want to... Well, how, how can I keep that as anything but a concept? Because the highest level, uh, am well, I experiencing it? By experiencing it, yeah. Yeah, well, that's so, what I want to do. And so then I want to find the places here where I can experience the, mm, the oneness. Now, the oneness is when you tell the story of love and how your kids are and how your, you know, whatever your family is, I can really feel it. And I can allow myself to be in that, in, in that empathy with you. And then if you tell me how your uncle's ill or something, I can feel that. And so then that's some places where I can... But that's limiting it to this relationship. No, that's just a starting point. You know? So... so I guess what I'm saying is that you can experience an expanded state of consciousness quite easily where you understand that what you're talking about is a is a is the smallest part of that the empathy that you feel is the smallest part of that so then it get, it's much 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 more than that and accessing that's actually quite easy and it's not a concept mm. it's a feeling and it's profound well, I guess what I'm saying is since the, the one you're speaking of is in a higher level, as you said, is vaster, it's, 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 it's way vaster, limitless. Yeah, yeah, limitless, it includes the other, and so then there's no way where it could not be included, that other part. You've you got to explain that to me again. Well, I mean, like, I'm, I'm uh, maybe crying the blues because I'm saying that uh, people are separating from uh, world pain. And they want to keep a space clean, a clean space, you know. And you're saying, well, it's just, that's the way it is, you said. Because, like, do you see anything here that's painful? And I said, well, we happen to have uh, the Sixth Fleet out there in the ocean with a bunch of uh, cruise missiles making sure that nothing's going on here, you know, which is okay. That's just the way it is, you know. But, I mean, uh, I'm just saying that uh, I'm, it's so easy just to say, well, that other stuff isn't real. It's just a bunch of thoughts. Those guys pain, you know, that's their own problem or their own creation or, you know, it's kind of like uh, hard heartedness. And I'm just saying if there's a oneness and vastness that wouldn't it include like the, the smallest particle of the universe, like uh, this manifest world. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so go on. I'm with you. So, so I want to open my heart to this, to this part of the world too, you know, I, whatever I take in spirituality, I want to make relevant, you know, I've had experiences and they come and go, you know, and I, and I, somehow it doesn't seem like always a natural that it's a uh, part of this world too, a part of this, you know, it's so easy to some kind of slip away. Oh, it is. And I think it could be a more part of our world. It is, it's very easy to slip away. But as I keep saying, having experienced it on uh, beyond an intellectual level and beyond even an emotional or physical level, then it changes everything. So I would be delighted to create the experience for those people who are... Uh, I would be delighted to create an experience of oneness for those people who are feeling separation. 
but I don't get to meet them. I get to meet some of them. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I see. No, so, I know. I know you're doing a huge work. So then I'm not. You know, it's not like I'm but, really but saying it's you're not. not. I, I can't. Uh, whilst I accept the perfection of everything on this plane, I can only really touch those that I interact with, or you know, maybe those people who watch this video and go, right. "Oh, he might, he might be onto something. Uh, it might be worth exploring." But that's otherwise, I'm getting, I'm getting sucked into a a, a very three dimensional drama. Which right. is part of the illusion of being in a body. Well, sucked in would mean like I drop into anxiety, but I'm not saying to drop into anxiety because that's the that's the only contribution we can make is actually to receive all that, but not be in anxiety, be in and create a space. Yeah, to acknowledge it as as being the choice of those people who are involved in that, and to hold our vibration at where we're at here, and continue to elevate it, and hopefully help others elevate their consciousness. Well, it might be what you say, but I would, you know, I would even want to be cautious of using words like choice, because like, how much choice do we have, really? We've got a bunch of kids, we need a job, you know, we're trying to pay the rent, and we're, you know, it doesn't I, seem I like... Think, I think we've got a lot of choice, yeah. but uh, that's just my personal experience. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a fairly poor neighborhood, in a not affluent family, with very few prospects in in three-dimensional terms uh, but I made choices and changes that changed that and took my life on another path so uh, you know I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth or with a, a great education but we do have choices and it may not seem that way to a lot of people who are stuck in seemingly difficult situations but I mean May, in some ways, who am I to say I haven't experienced a war, thankfully. So, but I think we we have choices. We can make choices that dramatically change our lives if we don't necessarily buy into the status quo or the dominant paradigm. And that can be the challenge. If we talk about Western culture where there aren't wars, uh, then people are pressured to by their own society and community and the media to accept the dominant paradigm, which may not be the most wholesome or joy-filled paradigm. So it takes an effort to change that, but it's possible. Anyone who's watching this video can change their lives in a moment, but they've got to want to. I guess I'm saying they got they have to see some possibility, some light at the end of the tunnel, and maybe that could be where coaching could happen. Okay, for instance, I lived in Italy for 10 years. I was always un underemployed, let's say. You know, I had some little jobs here and there, but somehow I couldn't really fit my, you know, I learned the language and all that. Now, I was just, because of this Occupy movement, I was just starting to absorb more statistics and stuff in some of the inner neighbors of, neighborhoods of Chicago. The black males have maybe 48% unemployment. So then it doesn't seem like there's a lot of possibility there because uh, everybody's looking for the same job if there is one. And it doesn't, you know, I, I don't say that that's all their fault or their choice, you know, but I mean, I'm not so sure. In my other life as a community artist, I worked in the area in Britain with the highest crime rate and the highest unemployment rate in the UK where it was considered dangerous to walk in the area that I worked in. And I, I, not that I was a spiritually enlightened being or seeking it at that time, but I always saw the possibility for change and I saw some people make dramatic changes in their life. So that it's, I can't speak for those people in that situation. I've worked in them, I've come from challenging, maybe not so challenging a situation as you described. Uh, but I've, having worked in those areas, I can say that, of course, there's always a possibility of change. It's accepting that the dominant paradigm doesn't apply to you. It actually really is that simple. This paradigm is not my reality. So let's say I am, well, I'm not. <laughs> let's say I was uh, black, unemployed, and poorly educated. Okay, it, That's a challenging situation to be in, I'm sure. But I've also seen people in that situation make dramatic changes in their life. But what it means is changing your community, and that's maybe the most challenging thing to do for people. It means changing your peer group. It means changing your values. 
So it's quite a big change. But so possible. then, like, uh, how could we help with that change? Like, a, a whole kind of, a lot of mentoring could happen. Instead of, like, now we kind of rip people down and say, oh, you're a bum, you don't know this, you don't know that. Even among our friends, you know, we're always trying to kind of uh, rib people and kid them and uh, joke with them. But a whole other kind of, a, if we could just open up to each other and, and actually coach well, each other. Well, yeah. I, I don't do that with my friends. I do my best to support them and understand where they're at. Uh, but as we said before, you know, you can take a horse to water, <laughs> but in the end, it's, it's always about free will. It's always about about choice. So I think we, if we take responsibility for our lives, so I'm thinking of um, a few people I I know, know who have had the most unimaginable trauma in their childhood, um, and yet in this time in their lives now, they're the most joy-filled, open people you could ever hope to meet so it's all possible mm -hmm. it's all a matter of choice and I, I can't make people's choices for them what I can do is create an opening for those who study my, my technique and hope that they'll then you know share it with other people do, do you see what I mean and I know that that technique brings about profound change in people because I've seen it so many times but I can only te I can only reach as many people as I can reach, and to talk about to go back to the bigger picture, I can't, or maybe I can one day, give Hillary Cl Clinton a crystal dreaming session. <laughs> that would be great. It would be great, and who knows? We might find out she's already there. D do you know what I mean? So it would be nice to facilitate that for other people all over the world. So that's why I teach practitioners. Mm -hmm. What well, you know, we were speaking about uh, completing or uh, completing emotional trauma, and uh, and a lot, I guess a lot of different kind of teachings kind of work on that in in their own different ways, right? And uh, yeah, but when you look out at the world, you know, and you don't have to look at the news either. You could just look look for yourself. Uh, it seems like. Trauma is increasing, not decreasing. So then, I don't blame that, but I mean, uh, on on these teachings, that I'm not saying that they didn't uh, release enough trauma, but I'm saying that maybe is that doesn't look like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There, it seems like you're okay. You're you're releasing people, but more are. Is that enough? Is that how? Is that? That's enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be because I'm at this stage in my development with what I have, I can only reach so many people. Uh, and it's plenty for me, I'm happy about it. But do you see what, see what I'm saying? That I, I can only right now touch so many people. No, I see in, in, in another 10 years or five years or next week, things could change dramatically and I could be suddenly touching thousands of people. But that, that's also all I can do. So all I can do is contribute at the level I can contribute and be, be yeah. happy about that. No, I see that. I didn't mean it that way, you know, that you, uh, you I, I think I really totally get it that you're fully engaged. But, but and, if and I, you're even multiplying with, by, by teaching, teaching practitioners. practitioners. But yeah. the challenge is if I go into a mindset of what about the rest, I think if I wasn't very careful, I would become depressed. <laughs> because how do I reach the rest? All I can do is touch those people that I come into contact with and, you know, like throwing a pebble in a pond, hope that I know, I guess, that those ripples spread outwards and touch more people. That's simple and it's achievable. Well, I'm sure we're both doing it, you know. In other words, when uh, with that aspect of us that is present to this moment, the opportunities arise and we, we see where things can be communicated and uh, where space can be made and uh, I'm thinking about you know actually I'll share about uh, Occupy it's that thing Occupy Wall mm -hmm. Street has started up but it really started in the Arab Spring and other kind of things I don't know we're kind of late comers probably but uh, I could re you know 
when they had occupied Chicago and, and there wasn't that many people, maybe a couple hundred people were holding down the fort. They were holding a space for 24 seven and they never did get a place to camp out or to kind of, it was kind of inconvenient to kind of hold it, you know, but they were doing that. And I was going down there and there, it was such an openness. You could talk to anyone mm. and people would look you in the eye and all that stuff. And, mm. and it was like, it just felt like there was a kind of a huge shift in the city. Right. And I remember uh, a week before I came to Australia, I went down there and I couldn't find them. They kind of maybe decided during the winter, it's going to be too cold. We're not going to be able to do this or something. They were off the street. And I noticed such a difference in the city. Like it was just like two or three months ago when and we were all separate. We're all feeding our face. We're all doing Christmas shopping. We're all, you know, all these little units and nobody look at anyone. And it wasn't. And uh, I still knew the space was there because I had experienced it. And I had that awareness. You know, I still knew it, but it wasn't so apparent like it was when somebody was really holding the space. And so then that's what I'm saying, well, you know, we'll be doing because, I mean, when opportunities like that come up, we'll just say, sure, my energy's in on that. Mm. So then, uh, you know, is that enough? You know, I say, is that enough? I guess I just have, I just have an idea that this, this teaching, you know, well, part of it is conceptual, right? Or taken as a concept. Which is, which one's that? You know, well, our wisdom teaching, let's say. Yeah. Just all the things we that are around us and in these progressive communities and so on. Wisdom teaching, let's say, or just kind of introspection or some, you know, whatever you want to call it. Somehow part of that is kind of like uh, traditions and methods, you know, which are are received as kind of like uh, a, a good idea, you know, that's good to do these kind of groups or good to uh, work on this kind of practice or something. And another part of it is just kind of like a be here now part, you know, that just means to, to uh, respond, right? To respond to life. And so then what I got the idea that uh, the wisdom teachings would be changing immensely in this, in this period where, where our manifest world is changing so fast. And I think that the wisdom teachings will be changing too. And so then that was just my predilection. I don't know how it's going to go, but you know, if, there's anything I could do to uh, to communicate what's happening, I surely would hope to be there. It's, it's what you're doing now. Yeah, it's what I'm doing now, right. <laughs> and you too, see, but that's just maybe what I mean by is that enough? I think Plenty, I just, I I just think. feel like there's a lot of changes brewing. I, I think it's you, we can only do what we're capable of doing in, in our heart in the moment. In the whether, moment, right. Whether it's a te- touches a thousand or a million people or one person it's what presents in that moment uh, so I think you know as human beings we can think too much about is you know you're saying is it enough well when you're propelled by your passion to go to Federation Square in Melbourne, let's say, and occupy Federation Square, which has been going on here recently, then there's no, there's no question about, is it enough? Do you see what I'm getting at? When you're propelled to create these uh, free to uh, internet TV shows, then it's enough. But it, it, it's it's about where our passion takes us, and that's so where your passion is, is it's enough. You know, if it's talking to an old lady on a park bench, it's enough. If it's addressing a thousand people in an auditorium, it's enough because that's where you, that's where your heart takes you. Uh, Otherwise, I think you can be self-defeating by going, am I doing enough? Well, of course you're doing enough. It's what you're propelled to do. I like the way you say whether it's a thousand, a hundred, or one, even one person, you know. But somehow, you know, I share about myself. Like, if it's no people, you know, it's so easy just to kind of isolate and just cut off and not be engaged. And I, I but somehow, there's a whole point of view that says if there's no people, that's enough. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> because your vibration that's, affects everything around you. You know, and some people very close to me feel that way. That that's enough just to be. So, I choose to interact. That suits my personality. Suits me here and now. Again, in five, ten years, I might be in a cave. <laughs> and that will be enough. In five or ten years, I might be in a stadium. And that, and that will be enough. <laughs> you see? It just... It's... 
it's all okay, really. I think if you are, if one is following one's passion and being in your heart with what you do. So I, I would like to be teaching my technique to thousands more practitioners. And I'm also looking at the legacy of what happens when I leave this body to ensure that that will continue to grow. Um, because it, it's helpful for people. So it, that's it's all okay, it's all enough. Yeah. What can you tell us? I mean, I know the best is just to, to assist, do a session, crystal dreaming session, right? But what can you tell us about how it works or like, I mean, okay. what does it look like or I mean, what does it feel like? Uh, well, it's uh, the client lies in a particular mandala of crystals that will trigger an opening in consciousness. The mandala is the same. Um, in the technique, it doesn't vary because it, it works very efficiently. So you have a session with a practitioner of change train they'll have an almost identical pattern of crystals uh, the client lies down in the crystals and normally a spontaneous opening in consciousness happens but uh, in order to ensure uh, that um, the client gets the most from the session we guide the session and take the client to a space where they can um, access unity consciousness in the process of doing that, the client will release all energies not totally aligned with unconditional love. So they present naturally as part of the process. Because what do you mean by ready. guide? You know, will you just have a, like a talking, guided talking, talking, talking yeah. soft oh, talking? It's a dialogue. It's yeah. actually a dialogue with the client. We take the client through exercises and uh, what they discover in the exercises, we can then take them down a particular route. But all, all roads lead to Rome, basically. All roads lead to bliss. It's a matter of um, what presents en route. With this technique, anything that's not uh, aligned with unconditional love feels threatened by the process, so it presents in the process very quickly to try and stop it. So we're dealing with that a lot. I mean, in my practitioner's handbook, if the practitioner's handbook was that thick, uh, that much is about bliss. <laughs> that much is about dealing with what is preventing bliss. So, yeah, but in, in the, an hour and a half, most people are able to get there. It might take two sessions, it might take three, but basically most people will get there in one session. That's my aim anyway, and that's what I teach my practitioners to aim to achieve. But if there's lots of stuff preventing people accessing bliss, then it needs a little bit more time. But as I said earlier, once you've accessed that state, tangibly, physically, emotionally, um, and not intellectually, then everything changes. You understand the perfection of war, famine, chaos. So it's quite hard to express in words, and I, it's quite challenging for me to respond to your questions, well, why is that happening? Uh, and it's all, in the end, it's all about choice. But until you get to that state it's actually quite hard to explain it during this process things are revealed that are kind of like have the brakes out or the anchors out and then you're talking um, you're guiding gently guiding through what is the necessity maybe the need of having this anchor right and that's where choice can come in too because you can pull in the anchor or that you could just let it go cut it off and say well, okay I don't need it <laughs> Yeah, the choice is about um, relationships with other beings, uh, wh when agreements were made and why and how come they're still there. Uh, about trauma, which I've talked a little bit about, it's like what, what was the feeling in the moment of the trauma that's being held and how can we release that. And of course, the biggest tool we use is forgiveness. Um, if a client can forgive those people who've abused them in this life or in another life, uh, then everything changes. Everything changes in that moment and the trauma's released. So there's a fair bit of that. And we're also dealing with other sentient beings who don't love us unconditionally, who are mischievous or misguided or confused and seek to disempower people. So we deal with those a fair bit. There are lots of them. <laughs> but they're pretty straightforward to deal with. 
I was doing a session, you know, like with a, a good friend of mine now. She's become a really good friend. And it wasn't really hands-on or anything. And we were just talking and just, I think it was the presence that was just magnetic and it was just lighting. And somehow we were, I was feeling what was happening and I felt this thing around my neck like this pressure, like this energy pressure. Mm. And it went into be a collar, mm. you know. And then it kind of, I don't know why, I didn't really relax or release, I'm not, I forget. Kind of went up, started to go up my neck. I guess I was touching something about that was, that kind of hurt, you know. And I was thinking of some past, you know, past experience, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it went up kind of through one half of my head. Kind of went up, boop, boop. And the other half, it's, or this half, it stuck in a little bit. And it stayed, and it settled here, you know, and it didn't move off of that. You know? And then, and then she said something about, like, I see this horse bearing down on you. And, like, and I think, you know, and then she starts saying, like, I think you were hanged or something like that, you know. And I just thought, like, what the hell do I care if I was hanged? I mean, I just, I'm, I, you know, I, I was kind of taking me away. I didn't, li I didn't like that idea that I had to relate that to something. And I just thought, why can't I just have this energy go off? And then I could say, well, you know, maybe I was... I was disappointed that I didn't, uh, you know, I could just be in this life and say, well, I was disappointed that I didn't uh, uh, satisfy my father in some way or, you know, and I couldn't communicate that. And so then uh, let that be as deep as my reasoning goes. But So know. if, if uh, my point of view there would be that I would like you to experience that without me telling you anything, and that's what I train my practitioners not to tell clients what they think, feel, or perceive, but to have the client tell them. Then, you know, if we were talking about a past life trauma where, where you were hanged, um, we'd be looking at how did you feel in that moment. And of course, it, it may well be about um, feeling disappointed that you'd abandoned your family by allowing yourself to be caught and hung, feeling angry and resentful at the authority and the system that hung you. Do you see, do you see this? Quite right, no. So those emotions then affect the, the repeated circumstances in this life. So let's say your friend was correct and she correctly perceived that you were holding trauma from being hung, which you reflected on your relationship with your father, then... Uh, Really, the enlightening part for you is the realization that the emotions you experienced when you were being hung are now being repeated in your relationship with your father because you haven't resolved them. And they will continue to repeat in every incarnation until you do. But you can actually release them in immediately. So you go, how did I feel then? And it's your realization. It's not me saying, oh, well, this relates to how you feel about your father. It's your moment of of total realization that oh that's how I felt then and those emotions are not in, locked into my body on a cellular level so I'm going to keep repeating them until I resolve them. Now I think I'm seeing you know because like you, you the, the story is only effective as it is like if this if a story of a lifetime or or whatever. Uh, is effective in allowing you to feel certain emotions and whether that story is correct or not correct that really doesn't matter the story is more secondary and, and actually the release is primary and uh, uh, yeah I don't know I, I, I've noticed that my neck is kind of dead for a long time mm. you know and I actually I've developed this persona that usually has a tie on and right, usually because okay. I feel so much better when this is covered you yeah. know and so one time in one of the, my shows, I was telling the guy that, and I took off my shirt and stuff, and then I could, I know that, you know, like allowing that not to be warm or somehow exposed can put me right into vulnerability, right? And I can go like months and months and never really cross that, right? And I suppose, uh, you know, because I've always got my little scarf on and stuff like that. A lot of people like to cover their neck. So... From my point of view, you could, if you wanted to, you could change that quite easily. Oh and, boy! Uh, and yeah, I do. Find out, <laughs> find out why. You will change it by understanding why you feel that way. And in my experience, based on what you've said, I would be surprised if it wasn't related to trauma 
and in another time and place release the trauma the feeling of vulnerability or whatever you're talking about around here stops as well you don't need it anymore because you're not holding it wow that's amazing Mm. that would be totally amazing because i mean i just always thought it was like uh you know, I've just kind of said, well, I don't communicate well. And then that's what Never Not Here is. Somehow I'm working through this thing. You're and then maybe good. it's not, huh? You're that's doing just pretty good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That sounds pretty thrilling. Uh, you know, I, don't, I would like to experience that. I guess I'll work that out later, <laughs> <laughs> folks. I'll work that out later. <laughs> so I will report on it. <laughs> so it's pretty, it is pretty straightforward and it's not so hard to release. It's just looking in the right place and uh, you know that's why people come to people I've trained because so far nobody's looking in the right place for them and then suddenly we look in the right place and it's pretty easy usually really easy actually and it's done in moments Uh, less than minutes oh boy (laughs) and so that's done all in the presence of kind of like tones you do toning or no 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 No, that's uh, my wife is the crystal singing bowl expert and that her work is uh, similar but separate to mine so she works with the crystal singing balls my sessions are quite quiet they're actually quite yin they're quite soft and feminine my sessions even though what we're dealing with can be quite dramatic and challenging and how do the crystals play in on it uh, they create the easiest way to express it is that they create an opening by focusing their energy in a particular way they facilitate an easy opening of consciousness for the client. That's the simplest way to understand it. Their energy facilitates that opening. It makes it easy and smooth. And um, so that we we as therapists are not working on the opening, we're working on what's dealing with what happens when the opening happens. Are you with me? Yeah, I kind of, my interpretation, like I'm trying to receive it the way I receive it, but it just seems like if you're in a different space, You know, your system doesn't really know what to expect. And so then there's like a few little peak holes there that things could pop out, you know, or lots, pop in, right? Lot, lots pop yeah. out, not in. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you take a client to a different, pardon me, expanded state of consciousness. And it works for most people most of the time. Nine out of, nine out of ten will have that experience. Yeah, well, you're just saying maybe a couple of sessions are necessary, right? So then... uh, usually my aim is one. Yeah, for of me course. personally, is one, but uh, for people I've trained, maybe two, but not stacks. Yeah, yeah. You will get to that stadium because <laughs> you don't have to have the per- same guy over and over and over again, right? <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. Uh, it, the aim is to uh, to assist people to clear what's preventing them accessing their life's purpose or bliss uh, or, or uh, yeah, joy, same thing, I guess, in, in one session if we can. That's my aim. Having said that, I recently saw a client three times, but that was complex and enlightening for me, actually. But normally it's one session. Yeah. That's the aim. Ray, my, uh, this is really, really uh, an eye opener. You know, this is really, really. You got me. You're totally stimulated. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, if you are stimulated, come over to Australia and learn the technique. It can go global. I mean, it's fully matured. It's 15 years practice, so it's a complete system. And in, I teach it in three days, so it's not a it's not a <laughs> year long training course. Oh yeah! Wow. You know, that's take that seriously, guys. I mean, like, uh, a lot of things are integrated, you know, once they become known into a lot of therapy. And uh, if something can really be, I guess, what do we say in a shortcut or a head starter? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, a platform. It's, it's a platform where so much can happen, right? A lot can happen quickly. And that's yeah. the way it's evolved. <laughs> I wouldn't say I designed it consciously, but. That's the way it's evolved, and that's good. It's what's needed here and now, you know. It's not, uh, it's it's right for the time. Yeah. Okay, like, I'm going to pledge. I'm going to look into this, you know, and I'm going to really tell you, this This is like, uh, come one, come all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and, uh, Raim, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Pleasure thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you.
Thanks everybody. Thanks for watching me work my way through Australia. It's like uh, not a, it's just a little over a week, and uh, I'm totally amazed. Every day is almost like a week or a month, you know. And uh, every morning, every dawn is a rebirth. It's, it could happen. It could happen in all of our lives, you know? and uh, we don't know what the limits are. And uh, for me, it's about saying yes and just about being available. But you know. We were saying that maybe someone that's in their own space and their own energy is getting their own, making their own contribution and getting their own feed, feedback that's helpful for them. So what do I know? It's all a mystery to me. And <laughs> so much love to all of you and, uh, and uh, come along with us. You're going to love it. <laughs> I am totally loving it. <laughs> Bye, Rain. Thank you.